This is the Obscurity to Authority Podcast with your host, Darren Cabral. Okay, I am here today with a very special guest. Very excited to talk about this. Um, she's an entrepreneur, business owner, built an incredible brand, um, rapidly growing, very successful. Um, I think we're going to learn a lot today. Liz, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the uh, podcast. My absolute pleasure. So why don't we get started by having you kind of introduce yourself a little bit uh, personally and tell us about your business, what you do, what it's called, and all the details there. Okay, so yeah, I'm Liz Jonasson. I own a company called Absolute Home Services, which is uh, our main office is in Burlington, Ontario. And uh, we do service a large part of the greater Toronto area and uh, Muskoka as well. Um, Absolute Home Services vision is to be a one-stop shop for homeowners to get um, work done on their home, uh, small or large jobs. Um, we really want to service our customer and create uh, loyalty with our customers. They use us over and over again. Uh, we've been in business for about nine years. Um, I started the company um, as a painting company when I first started. Uh, because I had a large background in running a painting business. I started my uh, my career when I was 16 years old painting cottages in Muskoka um, as a 16-year-old high school student. Uh, college Pro taught me how to paint, and um, I stayed with College Pro for 17 summers and years after that um, because it was a great company um, who taught me from the beginning of from how to paint to how to run a business to how to teach other people how to run a business. Um, I, after I graduated from university, I continued on full time with uh, College Pro to pass on all the things I'd learned and was able to learn a lot more about business and uh, coaching, training and leadership from there. So that gave me the fundamental background I needed in home services, in running a business and in painting to start Absolute. Um, but I realized that there's a huge uh, gap in the marketplace for people to get small jobs done on their home. Um, there's a lot of uh, companies out there that are willing to renovate your house and uh, build a house, do your kitchen, do your bathroom, stuff like that. But it's really hard to find a really reliable company to clean your windows, paint your house, cut your lawn, um, and all those different small things. And once you get a good, custom, a good company to do that for you, you wanna use them over and over again. And I learned with Absolute that um, you know, uh, it's not about the trade. It's not about whether you're painting your house or uh, cutting their lawn. It's the same thing. You need to provide um, excellent service uh, to homeowners. Um, so I, uh, I figured out those systems in terms of creating a great quote, uh, getting good people, getting them to the site and making sure the customer is happy. So now we service, um, we started with painting, but quickly moved into landscaping. Um, in the second year that I was in the business, I had the idea that lawn cutting would be a simple service to add. And uh, I loved the idea of lawn cutting because it was simple and because it was repeatable. We'd have customers come to our house, uh, come to your house every single week and then year after year. So we could really build a repeatable business, um, whereas painting is kind of every five years or so. So but lawn cutting quickly led to gardening and sodding and planting and then quickly into landscape construction. And the landscape division blew up faster than I was prepared for and uh, had zero background in running a landscaping business or doing landscaping. So there's a big learning curve for me of understanding the, the business and understanding what was the same about painting and what was different. So we did that for about three or four years, just painting and landscaping and growing a great brand with that. And then after uh, four years, we started handyman services because we found that our customers were asking, if you're going to you know, do the landscape and you're going to paint, can you fix this? Can you fix that? But I learned from my mistakes of growing too fast in the landscaping. So we grew that part very slowly, um, trying to figure out the business model first before we really blew that up. So we've been doing that for another five years. So now we've got pretty much most things you want done in your home, we can, we can provide that service. That's awesome, that's amazing. So a big part of you know, what I like to do here is dive into that kind of entrepreneurial journey and kind of what got you here because I think that's inspiring to a lot of people. And I think something that stood out to me in kind of that, that initial journey was that very first bit 
when you started at College Pro. So that was back in, I think, 2005, somewhere around there. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm a little older than that, unfortunately. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so it, it, was, it was a while back, but that was, I guess, your first experience in actually um, in the work world or in the painting world, or was there something prior to that? Well, I was 16 and I was in high school, so I had a job scooping ice cream for a few summers prior to that. But uh, no, uh, the the painting, uh, I, ne I, I, I went to university for engineering yeah. and I thought that I would be an engineer because I was good at math and science and that sounded like a great job and that's what uh, my parents thought I should do. And uh, that's what I thought I should do. And um, so I accidentally fell into entrepreneurship. I would never have done this if it wasn't for uh, College Pro. Um, I loved painting when I was there in the summer and then, um, they approached me and said, you know, you'd be a great student franchise. You could run the business. And I was like me business never. Um, but, uh, they gave me an opportunity to try it. And as soon as I started doing it, I fell in love with running a business. Interesting. See, cause I, I've met a couple of entrepreneurs that got their start in college pro, um, a couple that went on to start a painting company. So it's really interesting that college pro seems to be a springboard for, certain types of entrepreneurs. What was it as part of that experience that made you think, this is really interesting. This is something I want to do more of. Like what were the elements of that that kind of inspired you to keep pushing through it? Well, before that, my idea of business was working at a bank. I have uh, three older brothers who work at banks and they have business degrees and went to school for business. And that was kind of like the, what business was. And so that was why I was initially like, I don't want to sit at a desk and play with money. Um, so, but when I started running a, the business with College Pro, I realized it's entrepreneurship for one is very different from that. And two, it's about people. And uh, I loved coaching, leading other people. I loved the whole people aspect of it. I also love sports. I'm an athlete and love playing sports. And I find that running a business is very similar in the you know, fight to win, setting goals, working hard, working with the team. And uh, I find running a business and being on a sports team or leading a sports team is, is very similar. So that's the parts that I really love from the, from the get-go. That's awesome. So College Pro kind of helped to expose you to those elements of business because you had some preconceived notions of, yeah, business is this thing with banking and money and all these things I'm not interested in. But when you got through College Pro, you have to experience the reality of, no, it's more than that. It's it's people, it's teams, it's processes, it's, it's doing something that you love and being passionate about it and moving forward towards those goals. And like you said, winning, um, I think that's a great one because I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the show Shark Tank, but there's an entrepreneur in there, Mark Cuban, who's obviously a yep. bit billionaire in the software computer space initially. Um, and he says that all the time. He says that business is the ultimate sport, right? It's 24 seven, it's 365. It's not just a game. It's not just a play. It's, it's all the time. It's a, it's, a, it's a sport that doesn't ever actually stop. Um, so it's kind of the ultimate competition, right? So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I'm, I'm glad you had that experience because that, that's interesting. It's, um, you know, something that I say to a lot of younger people that are looking to start out in the workforce that go through a similar position as you did, where they're thinking, my parents want me to do this. And I thought I wanted to do that. And this might be the right path and the academic path or whatever it is. Um, but maybe they should be giving thought to why not try something a little bit outside the box? Why not try something where you can actually get out in the field um, or, or run your own deal, whether it's, I know a lot of people will, you know, rag on network marketing stuff, but even if it's network marketing and getting out and learning how to communicate, how to sell, um, you know, how to deal with customers, that stuff can be a little more valuable than maybe just sticking to a mold. Do you have any advice for kind of students or younger people that are getting started and looking for that first job or looking to kind of get their foot in the career? You know, what would you say to them or what guidance would you give to them? And you're saying people who want to be entrepreneurs or just, you know, graduating from university and saying, what do I do next? I think, yeah, I think people that don't know what they want yet. Maybe their parents have given them a, a guideline, but maybe intuitively they just doesn't feel right. Maybe something's off, but they don't know. Cause I think that's the most common scenario. Yeah, I know. I, I think that's a really challenging place to be in your life. I have uh, a few nieces who um, are just in that spot right now. And they had these ideas of what they thought they wanted to do. And as they've gotten to the early 20s, they've realized that isn't what they want. But then if that's not what they want, then what do they want? Um, it's a really challenging thing. And I think that you've got to go try different things. You know, one thing I notice is that people say they don't know what to, they want to do. So they do nothing instead. And uh, 
I think, you know, you got to go try it, experience it, you know, look at whether you're enjoying it or not. Um, talk to lots of people who have done different things. You know, you've got this idea of what your parents have done and the chances that you like what your parents like is probably pretty slim. So you've got to go talk to um, anyone and everyone you can to find out what's, what's out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. It's funny. I spoke with another uh, great entrepreneur yesterday, uh, which was uh, basically CEO of a company called uh, Macro Designs. They have offices all over the US, a huge company. Um, and he said the exact same thing. He goes like, the most important thing is to do something, get started, try it. You don't know until you actually go in. So I think too many people are afraid of, I have to pick something and that thing I pick is what I have to do forever, right? If this is what my parents want. I got to go that way. And that's the thing. They're afraid to say, listen, I don't know. I don't know if I want to work with my hands. I don't know if I want to work with my brain. I don't know if I want to be technical. I don't know if I want to be physical. I don't know if I want sciences. I don't know if I want trades. I think it's got to become more okay for them to try that and just say, hey, why not? Don't worry about your parents think. Don't worry about what your family thinks. Don't worry about the expectations or even what you went to school for because maybe you went to school for something. Um, I know that was the case with my now wife. She went to school for something she thought was what she wanted and that kind of boxed her in because she came out and was like, I can't do anything else because that's what I spent four years in school for. But that isn't necessarily the path, right? So being okay with trying things, I think that's a great point. Um, and just getting to something, not sitting there saying, well, I'm going to do nothing because I don't know what I want to do. Um, that's awesome. So I'll, I'll kind of go through that. So College Pro, that was your first kind of uh, introduction to what it maybe meant to be entrepreneurial. Um, what was the next step for you? Let's take it from there, from College Pro. What kind of was the next step once you realized, I like this, I can do something here. What did you do next? So I worked for College Pro till I was about 30. When I was 30, I, no, I was 32, I think, but I started having kids. Um, and that was challenging, having a career uh, and that I was very passionate about, but also having babies and trying to manage that part of my life was the most challenging part of my life. But also College Pro was full of young people and uh, 19, 20, 21 year olds. And I felt like I was going into that next phase of my life and you know, felt like it was time to take the next step. Um, and uh, I found that very challenging because I loved working with College Pro and everything that I had done there and didn't know how I could create the same entre- entrepreneurial environment. Um, and uh and learning and development and uh, the people but um i also had babies and so the i wanted to start my own business but uh starting your own business when you have babies and i'd already i had a house and a cottage and uh so two mortgages and two babies to take care of so starting my own business seemed uh very scary so i went and got a job with a restoration company and uh thought you know it'd be good like I know painting I know college pro I had no experience in any other business so I thought I should probably go get some other experience and um, I liked restoration because it was uh, taking people who's had you know a disaster like a fire or flood and fixing it and restoring their home and very similar to home services with painting and um, I did that for two years as the operations manager at uh, a large franchise which is what landed me in Burlington um, but in those two years, um, you know, I reflected a lot on the fact that I still wanted to start my own business and that working for somebody else was, uh, not for me. Um, and I saw this gap in the, in the world that, um, that people needed absolute home services. And I learned so many good things from college pro that if you could take a student and teach them how to paint and get them to provide great service, well, I can do that with, uh, non-students and, uh, and really build something. So I was there for two years. So my kids were two years old and four years old when I quit my job and started Absolute. And that was a pretty crazy thing. Even when I look back now is I still had those two mortgages and two kids in daycare and uh, just a hope that, you know, I would make more money and something, one of the funniest things that I thought that happened was uh, I went to the bank to open my business account. And I went to the bank that I bank with personally and the business bank person said, Oh, we've got your salary in here uh, wrong. And she told me the monthly number of my salary. And she said, yeah, it can't be that high. And I said, what is it? I'm like, no, it's actually higher than that. And she said, you make this much money. And I said, yeah. And she's like, and you're quitting this salary to start your own business. And I thought, I'm already 
freaking out and you're not helping me and you're you're the business bank person you're advising me to not not take this leap um so it was terrifying enough um but i believed in myself i believed in the vision of absolute and knew that it was the right thing for me um so that leap was scary um but one thing that i thought that okay once i made the leap it would stop being so scary but then i realized that it never stops being scary and you just constantly have to as an entrepreneur make bets take risks and hope that it's going to work out so when i bought we, we now have a fleet of 19 vehicles and the first wow. vehicle i bought and said okay i'm going to buy this truck and get them going i felt sick and then the second time i did it, i felt sick and the third time and the fourth time is you know every time it's just like okay well you got to continue to to invest and hope that it works out and uh Thankfully, after nine years, uh, I've got a great fleet. I've got a great group of uh, employees. I've got a huge customer base that keeps repeating and a profitable business. So it has paid off, but uh, it was pretty scary and when I first did it. Yeah, that's I, I can't imagine. I mean, obviously, as a business owner myself, I, I run a digital marketing agency that I started about six years ago, and it was a very you know small operation, me, a laptop, and we've grown, obviously, into a seven-figure plus agency. And, it's been crazy. But the one thing I keep telling myself is like, you know, I'm lucky I did it so early on before we had kids and before I had a family and before I had a mortgage, I started very early. I, I can't imagine how you did because I, I know the feeling of going through it. I just can't imagine doing it with all those. Like once you have kids, the, the game changes because you have that responsibility. Like, you know, I could afford to say, screw it. I'll lose everything. I can start over. You can't lose everything with a family and, and two mortgages or a cottage and you know, th things to pay for. Right. So I can't imagine what you went through with that. Um, that can only 10 X the difficulty. So, um, you know, much respect for that because that's, that's, I can only imagine how challenging that was, um, to do what you did, but you mentioned a very important point, um, which was when you were working at the restoration company, you mentioned, you know, working for someone just wasn't for you. You said something along those lines. I want to touch on that because I think that's something that a lot of people, um, feel and they, they struggle with and they don't really know how to navigate. What exactly did you mean by that? And how did, how did you know what was missing or what were you looking for? Yeah. And I think now I know that even more than I knew then. Um, so to put myself back then, um, you know, it's really hard when you're an employee, if you feel like, you know, you don't have control over, um, the vision of where you think the company should go. Um, like when I worked for both college pro and the restoration company, I, worked for them like i owned it i felt like i owned it i acted like i owned it um it, it i did own it in my mind and um but if you don't own it you can't uh push the vision in the way that you want and make things go the way you want so um it was really about that that um i didn't have the full control over the vision um yeah, I think I really like control. I also, I'm a risk taker. I've realized in my, as I get older, how much tolerance I have for risk. Um, so I'm willing to bet on myself. And yeah, I want all the, I definitely love getting all the rewards of, of running my own business, but you also get all of the, the uh, challenges and all of the weight of the world on you. And I felt that even when I worked for somebody else, I felt very responsible for the company and, and the results that went there. So there's moments running my own business where I feel like I can't handle that weight any, any longer. And then I get through it and I move on. But uh, yeah, I think it's just about control of the vision and, and driving the vision in the way that I wanted it to go, believed it could go. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I, I can totally relate. I mean, it, it definitely was in your blood. It was something you had to do at that point because um, you know, it's funny, mo all the things you listed as a benefit of what you wanted more of is a lot of the things that people that aren't entrepreneurial like to run away from. They have no interest. It's like, I don't want the vision. I don't want the responsibility. I don't want to feel like I own this thing. Right. Um, it's, I, I want stability or I want to know what I'm doing or I want to have a clear job description, to, but something in you was like, no, 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 I, I need more. I want to be able to control. I want to be able to build. I want some direction. I want to be able to you know, lay my vision over what I'm working on. And so eventually I have to move this way. So my question to you is, do you think in terms of becoming an entrepreneur, starting your own business, do you think that's something that is just in someone from the get go and they have to discover that? Or do you think anyone can go in that direction? That's a tough question. <laughs> I think it's in people from the get go, but most people don't recognize that. Like 
especially being in the trades business with myself, like just it's uh, common, you know, there's that book um, where oh, I forget the name of the book, but uh, the E-Myth, that's the book um, where cool. you think that like it, it happens in the trades where it's like, oh, I'm a really good carpenter. So I'm going to start my own carpentry business or painting business or, and so for some reason trades jump into, I'm going to run my own business all the time and they shouldn't be running their own businesses. <laughs> they should be, working for somebody else but then I meet so many strong people who work in corporations who are afraid to start their own business and so I find that very successful strong entrepreneurial people are are, are too afraid so it's weird how that happens is that too many people who shouldn't start their own business and too many people who should be starting their own businesses don't so I think you're bringing up a good point. I think um, more people should be starting their own businesses than that, that, that do. Exactly. Yeah. Cause I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. Cause yeah, you definitely see them trades. That's a fantastic point. Um, and I think it goes hand in hand with everyone thinks, well, if the majority of my work is doing this physical thing and I can do this physical thing really well, what do I need a company for? I can just go sell the service directly to a customer, but they don't realize that there's a lot that comes with that. It becomes a whole different game. Um, and the very physical thing you're doing sometimes becomes secondary to the entire infrastructure you have to build and maintain and manage. Um, and that's not something necessarily that they wanted, but they'll inherit when they go that route. And maybe they weren't a good fit for that. Versus there's people that, like you said, know how to do all that, um, but they're just scared. And I think that's just comes from society expectations. It's, it's having to make that leap that you made. They have that comfortable salary. They have that stability. They know what to expect. They have expectations from their family. And it's hard to throw that all the way and, and risk it for something that's uncertain, even though they know they might be capable. But um, I definitely think more people should take that leap um, if they can, because I think the rewards are worth it. Because if that's truly who you are and that's what you need, um, I think it's the only way to live. It's not really a choice. Like that's what you have to do. Um, and I think more people definitely need to explore that. Um, on that note, I mean, you've been running Absolute Home Service for a while. Um, what's been for you one of the biggest challenges? Like since I know there's many, I'm sure there's hundreds, but what's one of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome over the past, I guess, almost 10 years? The number one challenge has been cash flow. Um, I did not realize how hard that would be. Um, when I, as I mentioned, I had a good job at a good salary. Bank was like just handing out money to me more than I needed. I remember when I went to get my, my husband has a great job as well. So when we went to get our first house, when we were 27, they, they offered us just a stupid amount of money. Um, but we were like, what do you, we can't afford that. Why are you giving us all that? Then the day that salary went away, so did the bank. And I didn't know that that would happen. So what happened, like first thing that would happen was um, trucks or the vehicle to growth for absolute, right? The more people in trucks delivering to our customers, the more we can grow. Marketing spend had to be high at the beginning to get the brand out there. Um, but I couldn't uh, get any money from the bank. And I didn't realize that would happen. And I couldn't get trucks. Like the, I got a bunch of Ford F-150s and then Ford said, okay, five's enough for you. Your, your, you know, your limit. So I had a great credit rating, lots of great you know, couldn't be better. And then I was just capped at my ability to grow based on my ability to, uh, to cash flow the business. So, um, I, that's without a doubt been the halt in my, in my ability to grow. And how did you, that's a really interesting one. Cause I faced similar challenges and it's funny cause, um, I was joking with, uh, the, the accounting firm you work with, they're actually pretty big I think they're one of Canada's biggest remote accounting firms. We've got about 75 accountants work for them. But I was joking around with, with the owner the other day. Uh, he was saying his employees have a much easier time getting mortgages, getting financing than he does. And it's not a new, new business. It's a, probably the same age as yours. Um, he's established. They make very good money. But when it comes to financing, the banks just never look at it the same, um, especially early on. Though, like I had the same exact difficulties when we were buying our house. I had to put something like 60% down. It was ridiculous. Um, you know, and I was making more money than the people that were working for me and they were going out and getting mortgages with 5% down and bigger amounts and all that. So I can definitely um, see that. But how did you, from an operational standpoint with cash flow, like you mentioned the trucks, how did you actually overcome that? So when Ford goes, Hey, we have five truck limit enough for you. What's next? Like, how did you navigate that? Oh man, I don't know. Um, 
So I would uh, go to the next dealership. I would go to all the dealerships I could. I got my husband had to buy some of the trucks and put his, so I had to personally guarantee everything. Then my husband had to start guaranteeing things. Um, and then rentals. So I had to start renting trucks because uh, there was no issue with that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, steal from Peter to pay Paul. <laughs> yeah. A lot of that. That's the game. Um, yeah, just moving things around and uh, huge credit card yeah. uh, interest. You know, all my credit cards got maxed yeah. personally and business wise. And I had, a, I paid in that in hindsight was the right decision, you know, to get the money, pay the high interest so that I could grow. It was very hard to live like that, yeah. you know, like it's definitely paid off. But, uh, but I just, I got a lot of high interest loans. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. You know what? I, it's fine. You're, you're, you're saying things to me that are like ridiculously relatable. Um, I remember having credit card interest payments that were higher than most people's mortgages. And I'm like, what the hell am I doing? Um, so I can relate to that. And I'm really glad I asked that question because a lot of people when they're starting a business, you will hit a roadblock like that. Like you just mentioned, you know, they're planning, I'm going to buy more trucks. I'm going to grow. And all of a sudden people start saying no, whether it's a dealership, whether it's the bank, whether, and they go, look, well, I, I can't go any further than this. If they're not going to give it to me, they're not going to do it. Or here's this limitation or here's that limitation. And I've seen a lot of people quit at that point in various businesses from trades to service companies, even real estate investors where the banks will go, yeah, we've given you three mortgages. We're not giving you another one. Or we've given you five. We're not giving you another. They're like, well, how do you get past that? Um, but the reason I asked you that was because I wanted people to hear that there's no simple solution. It wasn't a magic button you pressed that was like, oh, you just call this person. They give you 20 more trucks. You really have to kind of scramble and find these different solutions. You're renting, you're using credit cards, you're, you know, someone's co-signing for things for you. You're doing whatever you have to do, even if it was messy and even if it was hard, um, but you didn't let that limitation stop you, which is, I think is, is incredible. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. And it's hard because when a bank tells you that your business isn't good enough to lend money to and that you're, you know, they're pretty rude, you know? They're like, no, you're not going to grow. And no, this is a bad loan. And, and you're, you're questioning that yourself every day already. And you're hearing this from, you know, people who you think kind of know what they're talking about, realize bank people don't know how to read bank financial statements and don't have, they're very risk adverse. Um, so that's, it also, it, it's the confidence to keep going when you're, when you're getting told by these people that, you know, your business isn't good and you're not worth, worth it. It's, uh, takes a lot of confidence in yourself to get past that. Yeah, I, I agree. And on that note on banks, hopefully this doesn't come to bite me later, but um, I, I'm in the same train of thought. I mean, personally, I, I do not enjoy the traditional banking system at all. I try to minimize it. I use it for transactions. I use it for storage. Um, but that's about it. Because you realize, like you said, you realize really quickly, people that work there, they might have the knowledge to service the average individual, the status quo, the basics of what happens. But as soon as you bring that, like as soon as you start making any sort of money or you're operating a business or things get complex, they have no idea what they're looking at. They have no idea how to handle it. They have no idea how to judge it. Hence why they're working there um, versus doing something on their own, right? And so I've, I've seen that. And there are great financial advisors out there. There's great bankers out there. They're just at a different level. They're not necessarily working at retail banks. Um, and so I've learned very quickly, man, like the amount of times I'll go in and they'll try to throw an advisor in a room and well, why are you investing in this? And why are you putting money into real estate? You should do this thing with a mutual funder. Why are you putting this into your business? You should take that out and put that. And it's like, I, I don't, I don't need that. I don't trust you. Stop. Like when we, <laughs> when I needed you guys in the beginning, everyone, like you said, everything was a bad idea. We can't give you money for this. We can't support this. We won't give you a credit card. We won't give you that. And then now it's, they have all these ideas, but it's, yeah, I, I can definitely <laughs> relate. Um, that's, a, that's a great point. So that was the, the challenges of everything. What's been, you know, maybe, let's give some people some hope. What's been one of the most <laughs> rewarding parts of running Absolute Home Services? Well, seeing my vision uh, come through is probably the most rewarding. It was an idea that if we did a great job for our clients and um, that they would continue to use us which is part of my vision. My other part, my strategy to achieve that is to create a great place for people to work where are we hire talented individuals and support them and train them to grow within the company. And um, 
both of those things have come true. I've got the first person I ever hired to work for Absolute still works here today. And many wow. of the people that helped me grow it are still with me. And so it's fun to sit with them and go, remember, you know, like when there was just the two of us, remember when it was just the three of us and now there's, you know, 45, 50 of us and a huge brand. And, uh, so I think probably that's the most rewarding thing is to go like, I believe in something and to grow it and look back and go, look, it's, it's worked. And then to think about, oh gosh, where can we go from here? That never ending opportunity. Um, and that's where I'm at now where it's like, okay, it's successful. It's good. Where do we go from here? And really the sky's the limit. Um, so to create something that uh, could last beyond you know, my, my lifetime and my legacy is, is a pretty cool thing to hang your hat on. And I know, and, you know, I'm 45 now and I have a lot of friends in between, you know, 45 and 55. And I think there's a lot of questions when you get to that age in your life going like, what am I doing and why am I doing it? And when you work for a corporation, I think it gets really stale in your fifties when you've been doing the same thing over and over again. And you can see the light at the end of the tunnel of retirement is like, do I really want to make more money for the bank <laughs> or do I want to, you know, build something that's great for the community, for the world, for people. Um, so I think starting your own business and, and building a legacy that goes beyond you is, uh, I mean, it's a life worth living. That's awesome. I a hundred percent agree. Could not have said it better myself. Um, that's, that's perfect. You know, in, in the 10 years that you have been doing this, because, you know, we're mentioning about becoming successful or feeling the reward of it all. What was the point, even you can say by year or a particular moment, whatever it was, but like, what was the point in that last 10 years that you knew you kind of made it? Like, this was a success. This is working. I'm, I'm in the clear. Like, how long did it take you to get to that? It took eight years. Wow. <laughs> Which is really long and hard grind, but... um you know, because I've always been trying to build this to be a, a large business and grow beyond me, I've constantly invested in the growth of it, which makes profitability quite low. <laughs> so, I mean, you can, it's hard to grow and be very profitable at the mm -hmm. same time. So, or profitable. So it took eight years to be in a position where we're making money and we're growing at the same time. And so it's, you know, when you're growing and you're not making money, it's like you can, it keeps you going, but it doesn't make you feel successful. So it took eight years to have both of those things combined. Yeah. I think that's a great point because so many people are looking for that, you know, success right away or that validation or like I quit my job and a year into this, why isn't it working? Um, I think they need to realize that it's a long journey. And if you get into it, it's something that it's not so much, how do you succeed in a year, but how do you survive long enough to see the success? Um, it will come, but it might not be in year one. It might not be in year two. It probably won't be in year three. Um, but at some point it will come if you just hang in there um, long enough and you keep doing the right things, right? Um, so I think that's that's super valuable. And you guys had a great year. I saw this on social media. I was kind of creeping through all your social. Um, you guys had a great year. You said you're hiring. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, COVID has been a horrible thing for most people. Um, and uh, I mean, it has been great for me, but it's been great for absolute. Um, it was obviously terrifying um, in March, 2020, when we had to shut down and the future was so uncertain, but um, the result was that people stayed home and invested in their houses. So that's been completely a benefit to absolute. We've uh, the, the sales and market, of the business has become very, very easy um, because there's just a lot more work out there for people. Um, and the government was fantastic in their support for small businesses. So that got me through the first bit that uh, where we weren't making, uh, hitting the revenue goals. And then, so 2020 was a flat year, but we survived and we did okay, but it gave a springboard for 2021 to be outstanding. And um, yeah, so that's, we had a 40% growth in 2021. Um, and that growth led to profitability, happy customers, happy employees. And uh, I think the 2022 has started off that way as well. And I feel like we're benefiting, but I also recognize that we're benefiting from a great home services market. Um, so I'm not getting too inflated in, in our, my ego about how things are going and we've got to watch the market to make sure it continues to deliver to us. Yeah, 100%.
So where is Absolute Home Services heading in the next five years? If you can give us a little taste of the vision. So, um, you know, currently we offer, you know, anything you want painted, anything in landscaping, whether it's construction, lawn cutting or gardening and handyman services, which is small jobs, um, but it also can be big jobs because what we end up doing is we do a small job for a customer, we'll lay some flooring, put in a vanity, fix um, their door, fix their deck, and then they'll say, oh my God, you guys are great. Can you do you know, more work? And we do take on those bigger jobs. We can remodel an entire house or people are capable, but that's not who we want to service. We do it for our, our customers. Um, so I don't see in the five, next five years that we're going to expand our services because handyman encompasses pretty much anything you want done on your home. We pretty much do that. But what I do see in the next five years is that we really increase our geography and our market. We just dabble in the Toronto area right now. Um, so my plan in the next five years um, would be to get to about 20 million bucks in uh, revenue. And that's by really taking on a lot more, taking what we've done in our fundamentals and scaling it into the Toronto region and really blowing it up there. That's fantastic. So obviously, you know, that requires um, a big push on the marketing front and the sales front. Um, and you've mentioned marketing and sales a few times through the podcast. Um, you know, I can't help but ask just being kind of a marketer myself and running an agency. We do work with a lot of service companies as well. They listen to these shows. Um, so I'm interested, what's been one of the most successful kind of avenues in terms of marketing sales and acquiring these new customers for the business, whether it be something active or it's referral based, what has it been for you guys? So I worked very hard on that in the first uh, five years on building a marketing engine that um, was consistent. And so our number one and two, no, our number one leads to, well, our, our customer, our number one sales come from our repeats. So 50% of the sales revenue we generate is from a repeatable customer base and about 10% referrals. So 60% of our work uh, comes from customers using us over and over again. So that's a really nice base to, to work from. The additional 40% though comes from search engine marketing. So we do have a company that is fantastic that does our search engine marketing from display ads to Google ads, SEO. And then uh, the second big you know, spend is on uh, direct marketing through flyers. So we send flyers to people's houses and I found that a combination of both of those things attract different types yeah. of customers or they get the flyer and they go to the website or, or vice versa. So it's a second way of branding, but it works very, very well. And then we use like referral sites like Homestars is a good, uh, a good one. But those are the, you know, that one is repeat referral, two is digital marketing, and three is uh, direct mail. That's fantastic. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I totally agree with the combination of print and digital. Um, not that we do print as, as an agency, but we've worked alongside other agencies with campaigns and we've seen a lot of success with that. Um, and even some of the things that I'm involved in, like we have a real estate investment company where we buy a lot of off-market deals and we just canvass the entire area, um, hundreds of thousands of flyers go out every month. And we noticed that it's not the any one thing, it's the combination of the things. It's a search engine with the print, with the radio, with everything going out together that seems to have that secret sauce uh, effect, which is great. So I'm glad that you, you found that as well. That's awesome. Um, is there anything else that you want to cover before we kind of wrap up that you feel maybe we missed or you want to share? No, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. It's fun to look back at my journey and uh, it helps me recognize how far I've come and how far we uh, have to go. So I appreciate the time and the opportunity to share it. That's awesome. And where can people connect with you uh, or Absolute Home Services if they want to reach out or connect or follow your journey? So our website's absolutehomeservices.ca. Uh, you could always email me directly at liz at absolutehomeservices.ca. Awesome. Well, that's fantastic, Liz. Thank you so much for the time. I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot. Um, it was a great conversation. I'm sure everyone else enjoyed it as well. Great. Thank you so much. Awesome. You've been listening to the Obscurity to Authority podcast. Tune in again next week with your host, Darren Cabral, as he explores the blueprint of success.